Hey, Daniel. Hey, how you doing, Blake? Good. Yourself? Good. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. At what altitude are you right now? <laughs> 50, 5280. I'm in, I'm in Denver. We're technically 5820 because we're in Centennial. I, I, it feels like, based on your background, you could be at 52,000. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is uh, quite a little more interesting than the, uh, the plain white wall uh, behind me. How high will uh, the plane fly when it's, when it's fully built? Yeah, up to, up to 60,000 feet. So, and is there so, a curvature at 60,000? There, there is, yeah. So the sky is a deeper blue, and you can see the, the curvature of the Earth. Uh, and that's, that's why we've got to put big windows on the airplane. Wow. That, are, are the windows going to be kind of, will, will these be the biggest windows on any aircraft? Uh, I don't know if they'll be the biggest. Uh, there, are, there are weight and performance challenges with making really big windows, uh, but uh, they will certainly be the largest supersonic windows ever done. Right. Um, that's interesting. Well, thanks for um, taking the time to chat. Uh, I, I thought it would be fun. For, you have such a unique company and such a unique story. Um, I thought it'd be fun to... Uh, um, to illuminate everyone. So I, I guess we should, we should start with the beginning. Um, uh, you were, I think, running growth marketing at Amazon? S sort of. I, I joined Amazon as a software engineer in, in 2001 uh, when my parents thought it was a bookstore. And uh, they were like, we got you this computer science degree. Why are you working at a bookstore? Uh, and then the, the really cool thing I ended up doing at Amazon was the, the Amazon's very first uh, ad buy from Google, and uh, and we ended up building out the automated system. This is this all sounds very normal now, but this was like 2002, 2003. Uh, built out an automated system to do all the, to do basically paid customer acquisition on the internet. That turned into a 300 million dollar PNL by the time I was 24. Uh, so I was, was very lucky to have that experience early, early in my career. So. You worked at Amazon, and then you started a company called Kima Labs, which was acquired by Groupon. Mm -hmm. And then you started building the next Concorde. So how did you learn to build airplanes? When, at what point at Amazon or Kima did you, did you study that? Uh, yeah, obviously, it's a little bit of a non sequitur in my career. Uh, I, I think I believe deeply is that passion and vision trump knowledge and experience. And if you are, uh, if you found something you really love that you want to make real, uh, you can learn. And so the, you know, the story for aviation for me goes back to, goes back to childhood. I've loved airplanes since I was a kid and I've been flying small aircraft for fun since I was in college. And you know, throughout my twenties, I uh, sort of had this thought that one day I would like uh, my passion for flight and my career to have some kind of intersection. I started reading some books on aerodynamics and, uh, 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 started reading airline um, uh, annual financial reports to just kind of understand the industry. And then, and then 2007, uh, when I was working at one of the first uh, iPhone app companies in Seattle, uh, put a Google alert on supersonic jet and I wanted to be first to know when I could buy a ticket and go Mach 2. And for the, for the better part of a decade, it was just, it was just crickets. There was no credible effort to do anything that would pick up from where Concord had left off and take supersonic flight to a more mainstream level. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and then fast forward, the, you know, fast forward nearly a decade uh, after having spent a couple of years at Groupon, I, I can tell you there's nothing like working on internet coupons uh, to make a year and to work on something you, you really love that's gonna matter to the world. And so I thought, well, let me look at uh, all of my startup ideas in descending order of how awesome it would be if they worked and leaving aside basically everything else. And so I thought I would work down that list and I ended up working on like number three or number four. But as, as luck has it, I'm still working on number one. And it was this experience of like, okay, let me get two weeks into the research and I'll, I'll understand why no one else is doing it. But instead found uh, a whole bunch of stale conventional wisdom that didn't stand up to a, a simple three line spreadsheet you could build with inputs that were published in Wikipedia. Uh, that uh, you, you, pe people thought that you had to you had to charge a huge premium for speed. People thought you had to solve the sonic boom problem or have a viable product. People thought you either have to be a, a, a tiny supersonic private jet for the ultra wealthy, which we didn't have the technology for, or it had to be a 300 seat supersonic jumbo, which we also didn't have the technology for. And it turns out, turns out none of that's true. Um, 
and so uh, and once I once I sort of realized that this space was more fertile than it looked, uh, I got really serious about about learning. Went to uh, did, did the Khan Academy physics class because I hadn't had any physics since high school, and um, took an airplane design class and read textbooks and then started meeting people uh, to kind of you know, test test ideas against people who knew a heck of a lot more about airplanes than I did. And so you started the company in 2014. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, we, we turned six uh, in about a month. Congratulations. Um, and um, and so you started the company in 2014. How, how do, do you convince anyone to, to give you money to build a supersonic airplane with the background that you had? Uh, with with great effort. Um, the uh, It was very difficult to get the first money together. My first company had made uh, had made money for its investors, and some people were happy with it. And they said, "Blake, we'll invest in anything you ever do." And I called them back and told them what I was doing, and uh, about half of them said yes, and half of them said, "Well, we said anything, but we didn't think you'd go do something that crazy." Uh, and so I, I think the smallest check I ever took was five hundred dollars. Um, and we raised uh, by the end of fifteen, we'd raised about seven hundred k, a good piece of which I had to put in myself. And then we did Y Combinator, and some uh, some important things happened while we while we were in YC. Uh, most importantly, that we got a deal together with a Virgin Group uh, to pre-order ten aircraft for two billion dollars, and that that significantly changed the, um, uh, the, the the credibility and the investability of the company. And so uh, we kept kept finding ways to convince people that we were real. Um, and, uh, and then you would basically raise, raise some money, go accomplish something important and then raise some more money and accomplish something else important, uh, lather, rinse, repeat. And eventually you've got a supersonic jet. Who was your first significant investor? Uh, first, first investor was John Collison. Um, and, uh, he and my, my CTO and I had gone out to dinner and we were talking to him about this. And this was, this was really, this was like early to mid 2015. And John, John said, well, I'll write you a check tonight if you'll just promise me I'm first. And uh, I didn't have to think too, too long and hard about that one. And what do you think John saw in you? I, I think he saw an idea that he really, uh, really wanted to be real and a, a fairly pragmatic plan to actually make it happen. Not a, not a boil the ocean plan, but a one foot in front of the other. Here's, here's why this isn't just a dream, but here's why this could actually work. And then, you know, an, another thing I've heard, I don't want to put words in John's mouth on this, but a thing I've heard from other investors is who, who, who put money in in that time frame, where they thought Boom had about a 1% chance of success, uh, but they, uh, they saw in me someone who would never stop and was incredibly passionate about it and would run through whatever wall was required to get it done. And I think that, I think that, inspired, uh, I think that inspired some belief. Uh, I also remember the... Um, the Paul Graham pitch, he invested on, on Demo Day. And his, his, his view was, um, so you know, when, you guys, when you guys succeed at this, uh, you know, you'll be worth something like three times Boeing uh, because you're gonna be so much more efficient than Boeing. At the time that was like $200, million, $200 billion. And if you have even a 1% chance of accomplishing that, that means the company's worth $2 billion right now. And you're selling me shares for 20 million. Uh, therefore, this is the best investment I've ever made. I was like, that's, that's great. Can I quote you on that, Paul? And so where, where was this dinner with John? Oh, somewhere, somewhere in San Francisco. I wish I could remember exactly where it was. But uh, I, I'd, met, I'd met John through a friend, and he and I had you know, talked on and off before he was ready to, to go you know, throw his first little bit in there, in there with us. And then um, how, how did you manage to get in, uh, I guess, so, so in 2016, you signed an agreement with, with Virgin. Mm -hmm. How did you manage to get that? Well, that's a, that's a heck of a story. Um, so we were, we were going through YC and uh, the, they told us kind of a few weeks into the program uh, that uh, you better show up on demo day with sales or your goose is cooked. And, uh, and so I thought, well, crap, I've got eight weeks and my, my sales pipeline is like, Delta, Lufthansa, United, like I'll, I'll be lucky to close any of these guys in eight years, right. let alone in eight weeks. And, and so we thought, well, there are really only two things that can work. Uh, we could go after a startup, uh, maybe someone who, who was doing uh, or had done uh, all business class subsonic, since our, our airplane's all business class supersonic, or we could go after Virgin. 
uh, because you know, Richard, Richard is known to have, you know, he tried to buy Concords when they were retired. He's known to have an interest in high speed flight and he's, he's just crazy enough that maybe he would do something. And, uh, and so we went after both of those paths in parallel uh, up until literally the day before demo day, all we had was an LOI from a startup airline. And I, I remember, I remember doing the practice pitch with, with Michael Siebel and, and he was like, Blake, you sound like you're completely full of shit. Do you have anything that's real? Uh, like this air is this airplane doesn't sound real. Your LOI is from like a startup. If that's not real, like show me something that makes me think you're anything other than just hot air here. Last thing we learned from that is to be really concrete in the pitch. Like the final demo day pitch was here's the engine. Here's the hangar that we're going to build the airplane in. Here's the leading edge of the wing. And just make it super, super concrete and tangible because it does sound like, um, you know, you know today we have an airplane in the hangar. Uh, but you know, back back then it was like little bits and pieces and a lot of computer renderings and people didn't believe it. Uh, but the the Virgin story, so we had we had started uh, uh, started dating Virgin actually a little bit before YC, and uh, some of my team knew some of their team, so we could walk into Virgin Galactic, and uh, and say, hey, um, you know, uh, instead of saying, hey, who the hell are you? Do you think you built supersonic jets? They'd be like, hey, Joe, good to see you. How you been? So we walked in with a little bit of credibility. You know, they were looking for how could they sort of extract the most value from Boom in exchange for supporting us with Richard. And so we realized we did another path to Richard. And this was, uh, this was February of 2016. Uh, one of our advisors was uh, the astronaut Mark Kelly, uh, who was personal friends with, with Richard Branson. And uh, in that month, Virgin Galactic was rolling out their new spaceship. And so... What we found was we could write emails from Mark Kelly to Richard Branson and he would send them. Uh, uh, sort of classic, you know, intro ghostwriting kind of, kind of technique. And uh, what we basically got a note into Richard that said, hey, the boom guys are gonna be in Mojave for the spaceship rollout. Uh, you should really meet with them uh, while you're there. And then we emailed our friends at Virgin Galactic and we're like, hey, we're gonna see Richard. Can we come to the rollout event? Um, and so uh, we, ended up, uh, we ended up crashing the rollout uh, I, I never actually got my name on the invite list, uh, but we got our 15 minutes with Richard Branson, and uh, and we, you know, he looked at this and he was, you know, we had a, we had a little wooden model of the airplane that we'd painted up in virgin colors that we like very reluctantly gave him as a gift because we we put so much energy into building this one little handmade model. Um, uh, and he, you know, he looked at us and he said, well, this is, this is brilliant. Like, I love what you're doing, but like, I'm already like up to here with Virgin Galactic and I can't do, I can't do two of these things. And we said, well, that's, that's okay. We're not asking you to invest in the company. Uh, we're asking if when the airplane is delivered, whether you'd like to have the first few with a Virgin logo on the tail. And, uh, and I said, look, if you're, if, if you're willing to raise your hand as an early customer, I'll go get all the capital I need somewhere else. And it turned out that was, uh, that was the angle that worked. And uh, we, you know, we agreed to do a little bit of manufacturing and test work with Virgin Galactic. Uh, and that helped, that helped sort of align interests over there. And then it was literally the day before demo day that we got the email from Virgin that said, okay, we're in and you can announce it. And, uh, and we went from, you know, in that moment, we went from what I, I felt could be the biggest losers of demo day. Well, you know, it's like these yahoos uh, think they can build supersonic jets and nobody even wants them to uh, this, this baby little startup um, just signed a, a $2 billion deal at Virgin, uh, which, which made Demo Day go fairly well. Uh, in fact, I, I can tell the story of that week because it was a bit of a roller coaster ride. We, we had planned, we'd been in stealth mode at that point, and we'd planned to come out of stealth mode the week of Demo Day. And we had, um, uh, we'd done an exclusive with Ashley Vance uh, at Bloomberg for the launch story. And if, if you don't know Ashley, he's a great guy. He's the guy who wrote the biography of Elon Musk. And so we thought this will be perfect. Um, you know, uh, uh, Ashley will write a very flattering story and, uh, and then we'll be, we'll be like the SpaceX of airplanes. It'll be great. And so we, we invited Ashley out to our hangar in Denver and we had uh, zero self-awareness about just how um, fanciful we looked at the time. You know, the, the only thing we had in the hangar was a couple cardboard mock-ups. And so, you know, we let Ashley's team take pictures of me climbing another cardboard mock-up. And then the story ran. It was actually a very, very nice story. But the, the editor got a hold of it and, and ran it with the headline image of me climbing into a cardboard mock-up of an airplane. Uh, and, and the whole thing, like, ran under the headline of, like, this Colorado company thinks it can build supersonic jets. 
and that that came out on Monday, and it was just cringeworthy. Uh, and then Tuesday we got the Virgin email, and uh, and Tuesday night I stayed up super late doing doing press interviews, and on Wednesday we we relaunched the company, uh, and it became uh, you know, and then all of a sudden it was like this other like oh I, this is actually credible because Virgin is Virgin's with it, uh, and I remember the. Um, the Monday, the Monday story ended up on Hacker News, and it was uh, the co- you should never read the comments, but I read the comments, uh-huh. and uh, and it was like, ha ha, what a stupid company, like what idiot runs marketing there? Why would the name an airplane company boom? And don't these yahoos know that airplanes aren't made out of cardboard? By the way, you know that all of the commenters on Hacker News are, of course, highly qualified pilots themselves, manufacturing F-16s, F-22s, F-35s, and <laughs> incredibly qualified to. Uh, to critique someone's attempt to build a better airplane, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no kidding. <laughs> uh, but Wednesday, we the the uh, TechCrunch story on the Virgin relationship uh, ended up back on Hacker News, and my my favorite comment, and this one was worth reading, was Monday colon ha ha what a stupid company. Wednesday colon oh shit. And and then there were these Twitter threads about like you know this is the way to launch a company. It's called the one two punch, and like what brilliant people must have worked in marketing at Boom to have planned this. Right. And I was just like, well, you know, you, you, you take your luck. Very true. So tell us uh, um, uh, a little bit um, just uh, about what it's going to be like to fly on this thing. Um, first off, uh, is there going to be Wi-Fi on board? Uh, yes, uh, super, super yeah. fast Wi-Fi. Is there internet uh, at that height? Yeah, it's, well, you're actually closer Are to the satellites. For the internet. So it's, so it's slightly better. Um, and in fact, uh, you've got only, you know, 64 other passengers to share the internet with. Uh, so it's going to be a lot faster. And, you know, one of the, one of the things you see with, uh, tech on other airplanes, I mean, we've all had that experience of you get aboard an airplane and it's clear the in-flight entertainment system was designed like 10 years ago. Um, and, uh, and the reason is so the air, airplanes are long design cycles, uh, going from locking down the size and shape of the airplane to carrying the first passengers, you know, for us, it'll be about an eight year process on overture. Like we'll, we'll freeze the design end of next year and we'll carry passengers in 2029. And so, you know, it's super long design cycle. And what a lot of companies do, and you see this in the auto world, you see it in the, um, you see a lot of old hardware companies is they put software and tech on the same design cycle as fuselage and engines. And the result is by the time something's delivered, it's already obsolete. And so we are, we're deliberately making the airplane modular such that uh, things that can be on shorter design cycles are on shorter design cycles. And so that, you know, the Wi-Fi system and the in-flight entertainment system, you know, we, we won't decide for a very long time what those even are. Uh, we'll leave space and power for them and whatnot. And then we'll go put the latest stuff on board such that, uh, you know, when we hand an airplane to the airlines, it's got the best stuff, uh, best stuff you can get. And so... How large will the seats be? I mean, the Concorde famously was actually pretty uncomfortable to sit in. Um, but, you know, I, I guess people endured for the shorter uh, duration of the flight. Is the boom strategy similar on the inside or is it different? Uh, no, it's it's different. So it's an all business class kind of setup. And uh, so relative to Concorde, there's been such a huge improvement in what you can do efficiency wise that you spend most of that just on making the tickets cheaper. So a ticket on Concorde was $20,000. Uh, so just not for very many people, not a large market. Uh, you know, we'll be able to get that down by about 75%. Uh, and, and then you take, you still have some budget left over to basically make the interior nicer. Uh, and so it'll be a business class style seat. Uh, it'll be uh, one of the widest seats out there. Uh, a big window, a 25 inch screen in front of you that you can dock your laptop into um, uh, and actually work on a, work on a big screen uh, if you'd like. Uh, the seat seat reclines. It's got five positions. The one thing it doesn't do is lie flat, uh, because when the flight is three and a half hours instead of you know seven or eight, uh, you don't need to sleep on an airplane. You can sleep in a real bed before you have to get on board. Right, right. Um, and uh, and what speed will Boom fly at? Uh, so we we think about it in terms of of the flight times more so than the miles per hour. So, you know, uh, New York to London, it'll be three and a half hours instead of six and a half or seven uh, wheels up to wheels down. And that, that means you can leave in the morning, make a late afternoon or dinner meeting in London, and then catch an evening flight back. And you arrive in New York in time to tuck your kids into bed uh, that same day. Or across the Pacific today, if you've got a, um, 
let's say you've got a Monday morning meeting in Tokyo. Uh, today you have to leave on Saturday. You get there end of day Sunday, Tokyo time. You try to sleep in a hotel room. You wake up the next morning, you try not to sleep in your meeting. And by the time you're back home, the whole thing is taking a minimum of uh, three calendar days. And you better not make any other decisions that week because you're so messed up from the jet lag and the flying that you shouldn't trust your brain. Um, and uh, what, what you can do when you double the speed of the flights is uh, you actually save entire calendar days. So instead of leaving Saturday, you leave Sunday, you sleep in the best uh, flatbed seat there is, which is the one at home. Uh, you leave Sunday morning, uh, you, you arrive uh, Sunday afternoon, say San Francisco time, uh, which is Monday morning, Tokyo time. So you're awake, they're awake, you do a whole day of meetings, catch an overnight flight back, and you're at home 24 hours after you left and there's no jet lag because you never had to transition time zones. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a lot faster. Will you be able to fly in the near term over the continental US or is that not possible? Uh, not supersonic. So one of the um, insane things that's a political fallout of Concord is we literally have a speed limit over land in the US. Uh, you know, the, the regulations say thou shalt not exceed Mach 1. Um, and ostensibly that's about noise. Uh, if it were really about noise, uh, it, it would have been a noise limit, not a speed limit. Uh, and it was, uh, the, the history of this was that Concord's uh, was a European project. This was the height of the Cold War. So Concord was established by treaty in 1962 between the French and British governments. Uh, it's, it's amazing the thing ever flew because, you know, they, they, they wrote all the documentation in French and in English. Uh, they built two factories for the price of four because they couldn't decide where to build it. But it, it, the, to cut to the chase, the Americans didn't have supersonic, the Europeans did. And so we said we can't have any of that sonic stuff. So, so we're started off focusing on routes that are mostly over water. Um, that's actually where most of the opportunity is, because uh, those are where the flights are longest and you get the most benefit from speed up. And then, and then in the second generation, we'll fly over land. You know, in, in a world where you can get from San Francisco to Tokyo faster than you can get from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., uh, like the entire California congressional delegation will you know, beat, down the, uh, beat down the walls at the FAA to get the regulations changed. And so are you going to fly it at 0.999 uh, or are you going to wait for a regulation change? Uh, so we will over land, we will fly at 0.94, uh, which turns out to be the, uh, and that compares to uh, 0.85 on the fastest commercial aircraft today and 0.78 on the typical aircraft you'd actually fly transcontinental today. Right. Um, and at, at 0.94 turns out the, uh, is the fastest you can fly subsonic uh, without risking accidentally going supersonic when there's a gust of wind. Aha, uh -huh. interesting. Interesting, spontaneous combustion there. Um, so you yourself have a pilot's rating. You're instrument rated, I believe, right? Right. Uh, are you going to be flying the boom aircraft? Uh, how, how could I not? Um, I, uh, so so XB-1, the, the answer sadly is no. Uh, it's a single seat airplane and our, our test pilots are um, incredibly credentialed. Our chief test pilot did uh, 200 carrier landings, many at night in an F-18, was an F-18 test pilot. They're one of the first flights of the version two F-18. Our other test pilots, an F-22 test pilot. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I, I think they might let me taxi it around on the ground, but I don't think they're gonna let me fly it. Uh -huh. uh, but, uh, but Overture will be like any, um, in principle, it won't be more difficult to fly than a Boeing or Airbus, and uh, I can't I can't imagine not getting my turn at the controls. Will there be a um, you know flight simulator uh, twenty twenty is coming out? Is there going to be a boom model uh, for FS twenty twenty? Um, let's just say that's a really interesting idea. Okay, great. We're <laughs> excited. Um, I grew up playing a lot of FS. Um, be said if there was a boom, um, and so when is um, the I guess baby boom going to fly and 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 then when is real boom going to fly? Yeah, so uh, so if you walk out in the hangar today, what what you see is an airplane that is literally nine business days away from complete. Uh, like it's uh, it's right uh, right up against the finish line, and uh, like the landing gear just went in, the engines went in, um, the I think they're putting the canopy on the cockpit later today. And uh, and then it goes to the paint shop, and we'll, we'll reveal the reveal the XB1, uh, you know, on its own wheels, uh, on October seventh. 
Uh, and so I'll, I'll plug this for a second. If you go to boomsupersonic.com plus XB1, you can sign up for the rollout event and be, be amongst the first to see it. Um, and so that'll, that'll roll out in October. And after that, we go into ground testing. And so you, uh, you want to debug everything you can on the ground before you go fly it. Of course, if, you know, if, if software, if software crashes, it's annoying. If an airplane crashes, people get hurt. Right. So you, you shake out all the bugs you can on the ground. Uh, we'll be Mach 1 by the end of next year in the air. And, um, and then Overture is uh, about five years behind XB1. So Overture will roll out in 2025. It'll be in flight test in 26. Uh, typically, uh, typically subsonic aircraft require about two years of flight test to certify uh, with the regulators. Uh, we're expecting more like four on, on Overture uh, just because it's more, it's more complex. And I think the safety bar is gonna go up and, uh, uh, on the heels of the, the 737 MAX debacle. So uh, first passengers by the end of the decade. And uh, in the early 2030s, we'll be we'll be building these things as fast as we can and getting them out there for people to fly on. And and so um, the Concorde took uh, the combined effort of uh, the two largest, uh, well, two of the largest European economies, mm -hmm. um, bill, you know, billions and billions of dollars, maybe fractions, small fractions of GDP. Uh, you know, will Boom? need kind of a similar amount of capex investment and and uh if not kind of why basically um so so fortunately the answer is no uh it, it turns out when you have unlimited government financing you tend to use it right and uh and so you know apollo uh, apollo and concord really share that same historical narrative you know both 1960s both uh, Cold War era kind of glory projects where the goal was to show you could do something technologically impressive with the entire resources of a country. Uh, and you, you can, but it turns out that when you do that, it's a bridge to nowhere. And if you, today, if you want a lunar lander or a supersonic airliner, you got to go to a museum rather than look up in the skies. And, uh, and so they had, um, they had no economic constraints. And that, that was, uh, in my view, that was a bad thing. Because uh, they didn't have to build a sustainable economic model, they didn't have to learn how to operate with limited resources, and so you know, 50 years later, um, you know, one, we get to stand on their shoulders. Uh, we also get to leverage a lot of what's been developed elsewhere in the industry, and this this turns it into a you know an engineering and safety testing effort, not a invent new technology from scratch effort. And so we estimate we're going to need about three quarters of a billion in equity uh, before IPO. Uh, which is, it's a lot of money, but it's an obtainable amount of money. And we deliberately structure uh, you know, our technical and commercial milestones relative to our financing milestones. So we can you know, get the valuation of the company up and get access to the capital we need without diluting out everybody. So uh, my, my, my goal there is to make John Collison very happy on the day of IPO. Are you going to let John Collison fly boom? Or are you going to deny his request? <laughs> Yes, we're going to be we're going to be huge jerks about that. Yes, yeah. so that's that's how, that's how we like to roll. Very interesting. Uh, and um, uh, and 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 so Overture is the proper aircraft, or is that still a scale model compared to with the proper? Uh, no, Overture is full scale. Full scale. Uh, it's the uh, it's the first full scale airplane. So that that's what you see behind me here. It's uh, sixty five to eighty eight seats, uh, depending on uh, how close you put them together. Um, and uh, and that is a, that's our first airplane. And what what happens after Overture is is actually pretty interesting. Um, if you look back at history, so I, you, you and I, and I, I imagine most of the people who are watching now are are too young to have lived through a speed up. So the last time we did was late 1950s, early 1960s, when we went from props to jets. And uh, what happened then was the you know, for example the 16 hour flight from San Francisco to Honolulu. Uh, turned into a, a six or seven hour flight that it is today. And you might, you might think like, oh, people would spend less time on airplanes, but they actually spent more time on airplanes uh, because it was more worth going places and places were more accessible. And right. uh, you know, travel to Hawaii went up sixfold in the first 10 years of the jet age. And so if we, uh, if we see the same thing happen with supersonic, which I, I think we will, uh, you know, we're going to find that when, you know, when Sydney is eight hours away, not 16 hours away, um, you know, we, we might choose to go down under more often. And, uh, and so I think you'll see an explosion in travel just as that time barrier. It's not the speed barrier that matters, it's the time barrier. Break the time barrier, there's gonna be more travel. 
And then what we'll find is this, you know, 65 seater is way too small. And we'll need to build a second generation aircraft that is larger. And it turns out when you go larger, uh, this is you know, this is true subsonic, but it's even more true supersonic. You can make the aircraft significantly more efficient. Mm -hmm. And so think of it as, you know, t still two pilots, but more passengers. Think of it as the, the volume of the aircraft is cubic with its dimension, but the surface area is only quadratic, uh, which means as you go bigger, there's less skin friction drag per, uh, per passenger. Uh, moreover, there's some other things aerodynamically that don't work on a small airplane, but they work in a big airplane. And so that lets you build a second generation aircraft that's larger, therefore it's more efficient. Therefore it can have more range, higher speed and lower fares, uh, all of which is gonna translate into more people flying which will translate to a third generation aircraft that's larger and more efficient and, and so forth. You kick off this like virtuous cycle uh, that we haven't had for half a century in aviation uh, where uh, speed ups beget uh, economy beget uh, speed ups. And so uh, we'll see, you know, uh, Overture 2 and Overture 3 uh, will be larger, they'll be more efficient, there'll be new more new technology on them. And uh, I, I think within our lifetimes, we're gonna find that the, the cheapest fare is the fastest fare. Um, and, uh, and if that sounds just like impossibly good to believe, too good to believe, like, remember that the propeller flights to Hawaii don't exist anymore. Uh, and it's because the same thing already happened. Yes. It very interesting. And, and on the topic of aerodynamics, um, the Concorde obviously was famous for its crooked nose. Um, why not, uh, why do OA with that design? What did they get wrong there? Yeah. Well, um, so do, do you know, do you know why they had the, the droop nose? I, I assume it was because it was only sufficiently aerodynamic at high speed or something. Uh, not exactly. I mean, you do, you do actually want the, the pointy high nose for high speed, but the reason they had to lower it was so the pilots could see the runway to land. I see. Like they literally couldn't see over the nose of the aircraft because it was too long and too long and pointy. And uh, XB1 and Overture also have long pointy noses. Uh, but, but today we have this amazing thing called a camera. Uh -huh. uh, and a retina display, and uh, this this is what we're doing in XB1. Literally, the, the top half of the pilot's uh, primary display uh, has a, you, if there's like camera toggle button you can hit, then it flips over and you get all your flight controls overlaid on top of what is a virtual window through the nose of the airplane. And so you get you get better runway visibility uh, than you get with um, with a traditional subsonic cockpit. Uh, and you don't have all the complexity and failure modes and weight of this, this moving nose mechanism. So it, sa it saves a bunch of weight off the aircraft and uh, it, it, weight, is, uh, weight is evil on airplanes. Uh, yeah. whenever, whenever the airplane gets heavier, uh, it needs more thrust to hold it up. Uh, that means it needs more gas. The gas weighs something, uh, then the wings have to get bigger and the engines have to get bigger and it becomes this like vicious cycle. Uh, like one, one pound of additional empty weight translates into roughly three pounds of total airplane weight just because you have to carry more fuel. Uh, so it's, it's, really, uh, uh, it's really, really bad. Um, and, uh, and so anything you can do that get weight, gets weight out of the airplane uh, really helps you. And so, so we'll wave goodbye to the, the droop nose. Good, good rhinoplasty upgrade. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it turns out the nose design is really important. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's essential to the whole airplane working. Uh, like you, when you, um, so the way a, a traditional airplane flies is you've got these uh, sort of your teardrop shaped wings, right? And uh, the, that shape serves to accelerate the air over the wing relative to the way air under the wing. Uh, you get a pressure delta, therefore lift, and you, you can land with the nose just up a little bit. Uh, but a delta wing aircraft, uh, if you look at the, the wing area, there's a lot less wing area than there is on a subsonic aircraft. It's a teeny tiny, like unbelievably small wing. And that works in supersonic speeds because you're going so fast, you get a lot of airflow over the wing. Uh, but in subsonic speeds, the physics are actually completely different. Uh, you come in with the nose high and, uh, and you're in what's called vortex lift. So the, the nose plus the leading edge of the wing generate this swirling airflow. And again, Bernoulli's principle kicks in. The, the higher velocity swirling air generates a lower pressure region. That generates low pressure above the wing relative to uh, below the wing and the delta pressure gives you lift. Uh, but what's interesting is those vortices can really mess with you if you don't get them exactly right. And so there's a, there's a vortex that comes off the, the nose of the airplane, again, sort of a low pressure region. And if you are in, um, we've probably all seen those YouTube videos where it's like airplanes landing sideways and crosswinds as part of the testing. And so you have to worry about those cases. And, 
and what we what we found is one of the hardest things to get right aerodynamically was that nose vortex would go so that low pressure region would go across the fuselage of the airplane and then it would sit next to the vertical tail and uh it, when you're kind of crabbed into the wind and you, what your tail is supposed to do is have a, a high pressure region there that's going to cause the tail to weather vane the whole airplane get it right. straight again right but with the low pressure region in the wrong place when you go sideways a little bit it would just want to go it would want to go swap ends on you and so it's it's what we call in aviation not a good day uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so we we had to do you were talking about rhinoplasty we, we went through uh we, we called it giving the airplane a nose job we went through many iterations of nose and if you look at the the xb1 nose it's it's subtle but the whole thing is like flattened a little bit it's tapered in a really complex way Absolutely. and then it gets that that nose geom that nose vortex to be just right beautiful um Beautiful. Now on the topic of speed, uh, obviously something that mad, it strikes me that something that matters for your project is the engine uh, of the airplane itself. Um, mm -hmm. I believe uh, you, you guys somehow managed to convince Rolls-Royce uh, to build for you. H how did that happen? Yeah, so this was, um, this was a breakthrough moment that happened just a few weeks ago uh, where we, we got Rolls-Royce to uh, speak publicly that they're working on an engine design for Overture. Which is, which is huge because without an engine, uh, airplanes don't, they don't really fly. Um, <laughs> yeah. It becomes a very expensive glider. But no uh, red Flintstone aircraft. Right, exactly. So, and, and this is, uh, I'll tell you the story of this because it, uh, it's uh, one of the things I'm most proud of and it, it literally went back five years. So we, we knew, um, I, think, I think I had my first call with Rolls-Royce before I'd actually onboarded the first employee. It was literally like me and a couple advisors in Rolls-Royce starting to talk about engines. So we knew, we knew it'd be the long pole in the tent. And for, um, and we look at that, if you look at that relationship over five years, there were a couple of, uh, a couple of key inflection points where we were able to like really move it forward. And I, I can tell some of those stories because they are, uh, I don't know, I think they're just fun stories. Uh, one was when, around the time we were raising our, um, raising our series A. And, and so at this point we'd, we'd raised a few million dollars in seed funding uh, but not enough to build an airplane or to kind of do anything interesting. And you know, our our secret fear was that this this company would come and go uh, without ever having built anything real. Well, how do we raise you know thirty odd million dollars to go build a supersonic jet? And uh, you know, and we had we had potential investors, and the, the smart ones are asking questions like, who's going to build the engine? Uh, we you know we were able to get phone calls with Rolls Royce, and of course they would say, who in the world is investing in this company? Um, and they, they all wanted to talk to each other. And so what we ended up doing was uh, we threw a big party. We built a, uh, a, a full mock-up of XB-1 out of uh, styrofoam and hard coat. Uh, we basically bet the company on it. We spent a non-trail percentage of all the money we had in the bank to go build this mock-up and, uh, and throw a party. And we invited everyone we could think of. You know, so we invited Rolls-Royce and GE and we invited um, all the airlines we could get to come and we invited uh, prospective investors and we invi invited um, half a dozen former Concorde pilots and engineers that we could find. Uh, Cause we were like, how can we, how can we add like maximum credibility to this, you know, unveiling of a paperweight. Um, and so we, uh, we it, so we threw a big party and it, and we, you know, we very proudly said, this is XB1 in mock-up form and uh, people were, people were excited by it. And then, um, you know, and then the next day we used for biz dev. And so we had we had prospective Series A investors, and we had uh, we had Rolls Royce, and uh, we took a deep breath and we said, "Okay, Rolls, uh, would you be willing to do us a solid and meet with some of these investors uh, and tell them why uh, why you like Boom, uh, why you flew across the pond to to have this conversation?" And then we and then we went to the investors and we said, "Well, we we understand you like to add value. Can you show that to us by uh, by telling uh, telling Rolls Royce why why you think this is a really interesting company to fund?" And then we, we, we uh, kind of held our breath and we put them in a conference room together and uh, basically watched as they closed each other. Um, and so that, and that uh, really accelerated, you know, it made our series A happen and it really accelerated um, the, the engagement we have with roles. And then, so that's, that's inflection point number one. And that, that got us to the point of like a little bit of technical work and like regular quarterly meetings uh, did not get us an engine. Right. And, and we were trying to figure out how do you get to the next piece of it. And the next, next inflection point was in early 2018. Um, and our, our technical contact uh, uh, over at Rolls invited me to give the uh, Royal Aeronautical Society Jeff Wild lecture, which is this like, 
it, it's, it's like a real honor to do this. Like usually that's like the head of golf streamers, somebody, uh, somebody really impressive that gets to give this talk. And it's ostensibly at the Royal Aeronautical Society in, in Derby, but it's actually hosted at Rolls-Royce. And in, in reality, uh, the audience is 300 Rolls-Royce employees and, uh, and like five people from the public. And so I thought, well, ha, this is, this is my chance to uh, pitch uh, 300 Rolls-Royce employees all in one go. And, and my thought was, let me, let me see if I can inspire them such that if, if for some reason they, they don't want to do this with us, that they will then um, have a morale problem uh, on their hands. And so, and so I got up and I told the boom story and I talked about how small numbers of people can change the world uh, if they're willing to be seen as crazy. And, um, and then after, after it, went over, it went over fairly well. And then that, that night I uh, had dinner with the head of strategy uh, of the company. He was kind of the key decision maker on what, what new things they'll go do. Um, and uh, it was a you know, very traditional business dinner, you know, like you'd expect. And at the end of it, I said, well, let's go for a walk. And he's like, what? I was like, let's get outside. Let's go for a walk. And all of a sudden, uh, there's just something magical about walking meetings and something magical about walking biz dev. Because uh, all of a sudden, people get way more candid and they ask you the questions that they really have on their mind. Like, I remember he asked me, um, so what, what do you really want from Rolls Royce? Do you want us to put out a press release so you can fundraise? Do you want us to invest in your company? Like, what do you, what do you want us to do? And I said, well, um, I've heard you're in the jet engine business and uh, I, I'd love for you to build us some jet engines. And, and this was a, oh, moment for them. Because uh, they, they, they realized that we were, were dead serious about actually doing this. Uh, not just like looking to build something cute that Boeing would buy. Um, and uh, after, after that, the, again, the engagement went through a step change. Uh, and then it got to, a, got to a point where we would regularly get our engineering teams together, uh, regularly get our business teams together. And we got to a point where they had confidence in us on the business side, they had confidence in us uh, on the, the technology side. They, they knew they actually had an engine design that would work. And, uh, and then we were able to get that across the finish line for an announcement, uh, like I said, just a couple of weeks ago. It strikes me that um, others, there's a, if, if there's one lesson here, it's that Blake getting dinner is a great idea. It seemed like it worked with John. It seemed like it worked with Rolls Royce. <laughs> um, right. So, so it turns out the secret to success is, is eat. How much? Yeah, exactly. How, what are you putting in their drinks? Let's, um, uh, there's, there's a, there's a, I mean, we're being tongue in cheek about it, but there's like a real point there. Yeah. Uh, like people get, people, people get very guarded in conference rooms. Um, uh, but informal settings brings out people's humanity. And this is, this is one of the reasons why Zoom is never going to replace travel. Yes. Uh, is you, you lose all the informal interaction and you lose you know, something like half of, half of the actual communication content. And so get, getting people in informal environments, making it, uh, making it disarming, uh, inspiring candor or being candid yourself uh, is, is really important for making some of these key things happen. And, and when in-flight entertainment started in 2000 and maybe six, seven, eight, there was a flurry of activity around letting people in airplane message each other. Is Boom going to have IRC on the airplane? Uh, uh, is Boom going to have IRC on the airplane? I, I, have, I have no idea. <laughs> Um, uh, what, the, what, what, what will the food service be just over three hours? I mean, are you guys just going to serve coffee or, or is there a quick uh, caviar service plan? <laughs> so it's, it's up to the airlines, obviously, because you know, we're, we're, we're putting good galleys in there where, uh, where they can go do whatever they want to do. Uh, but it, it's, it's an interesting contrast between what Overture will be and what Concord was. Um, uh, so uh, on Concord, they had a gigantic mock meter, a huge screen in the front of the airplane. I went through one. The captain would get on the, the PA and congratulate everyone for being supersonic. And they'd come around with champagne and caviar and the whole airplane would kind of have a toast. And, uh, you know, I imagine the first few overture flights will probably be like that. Uh, but I, I'm looking forward to the day when passengers find that annoying. Right. They just want to get, you know, it's commonplace and they just want to get back to their book or their movie or whatever, whatever work they were doing. And, uh, and when, when supersonic is unexciting, uh, then we know we've won. One thing I'm curious to, to hear you uh, just expand on is I imagine uh, before you started signing contracts with airlines, the idea of vertically integrating uh, must have come about quite a bit. I imagine also investors were interested in it. 
how did you think about potentially doing that, being the airline, being the first, I guess, manufacturer to also be the airline? And why did you decide not to go down that path? So I, when I told the, the story, original story of Boom earlier, I, I skipped a step. Uh, is that the truth was I didn't have the courage to look at Supersonic in the first go. Uh, I, but I could, I could uh, brace the idea of building an airline. And, and so uh, the first, first week or two uh, in aviation was modeling out what would be the best airline you could build with today's airplanes. And, um, and I got down path with that. I concluded there was just no durable differentiation. Like it, it was too, if you're building off of somebody else's airplane, you know, ultimately your competitors could just go copy whatever your innovative service concept was, um, or they'd throw the regulators at you and, and you know, hamstring your ability to be, uh, to be streamlined. And so, so boom, so I thought, okay, well, it, this, this model actually needs a better airplane to succeed. And, and so the, the, we got our start planning to be vertically integrated, uh, airline and airplane. And uh, it turns out that, it, well, that, that it's a very exciting idea because there are innovations you can deliver when you simultaneously control airplane, airline operation, and airport. Like, you know, if, if, if anyone on this call thinks for like 30 seconds about how baggage handling could be better. If, if you started from a clean sheet of paper, you can change all those things. Um, you, you could imagine things a lot better than the, like the crazy baggage system we have today. Um, but the, the challenge turns out to be that um, it's much, much harder to bootstrap the business. Um, investors, uh, in, investors wanna know that you've got product market fit, the customers really want it, and you can't, you can't pre-sell tickets to the flying public 15 years out. Uh, moreover, suppliers don't buy it. Like you have to convince the Rolls Royces of the world that this is real, uh, and uh, having airlines is part of how you do that. And then there are a lot of other challenges. Like air, airlines are a hard business in their own right, and uh, we got convinced. Let's do one hard thing at a time. Uh, uh, supersonic jets, jets hard enough. You don't have to go build a, a global network as well. And, and the, the airline industry is also it's very uh, it's very balkanized. Uh, you know we have. Uh, we have a small number of airlines kind of in each major geography. We don't really have a global airline. And the, the reason for that is that there are, um, in, in, you know, air, airlines are tied up, aviation is tied up with national prestige kind of around the globe. And so, uh, you know, you have, you, have, you have countries who have their flag carriers. And, you know, if you want to go, for example, uh, set up shop with your own airline in Dubai, Yes. Uh, my, my expectation is the government would say, well, that's very nice, but we already have that. It's called Emirates. Yes. Um, and so you, you, uh, in practice, you would end up with all these like market entry challenges. And so you, you want to, um, uh, you want to go partner with great airlines, uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, you mentioned, uh, earlier on, you had a whole list of, uh, ideas you were contemplating before you started boom. <laughs> What do you kind of think is the boom of today? Uh, you know, what would you be working on if not boom? Um, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so uh, I have this deep belief that there are more interesting, important problems in the, the world uh, than, than kind of people to go work on them, or at least people, people choosing to work on them. Uh, like you tend to get told in Silicon Valley that if you have a good idea, there are half a dozen uh high quality teams already working on it. Uh, that the like, law of large numbers applies to startups. And I just, I think it's just not true. I don't think it's true in tech. It's definitely not true outside of tech. Because uh, we've, that, that some of the most important problems are sitting in uh, plain view, uh, just waiting, you know, waiting for someone to lock onto them. Uh, like like the, the morass that is air transportation today, like we all experience it. But prior, prior to boom, like no one was really working on it. Uh, and I think there are, um, there, there are many other things that are like that. Like, um, uh, I'll, I'll give a couple of my, my, my pet favorite ones that I wish, maybe someone on this call will go, go tackle. We've all had that experience where we're sitting in a traffic light uh, waiting to go. And there's actually no one in the intersection because the light's in the wrong state. Right. Um, and, you know, if we have any hope of building autonomous vehicles, couldn't we at least build smart traffic lights that would... Um, uh, where each intersection would network to the one over and they would know where the cars are coming and they would, if someone's about to run the light, they actually wouldn't turn the other one green so there couldn't be a, a crash. And I, I think you could actually save a lot of time on the ground. Um, and there are, there are other things that are like that. Like I, a while ago, I was like, okay, whatever I'm stuck in traffic, I have to think about how to make traffic better. Uh, but there, there are things like that uh, uh, that are just massive problems hiding in plain sight 
uh, where uh, where uh, there's just an opportunity for a huge breakthrough. And it doesn't have to be technologically sophisticated. It just has to be locked onto the right problem. I like that. Um, uh, 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 how, would, how would you just, you pitch that? Something like jaywalking as a service or uh, running red lights. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a there's there's a killer model on this that actually makes it a multi-billion dollar business but i'll uh, i'll uh i'll keep that to myself for right now well people can find you and reach out to you and and, and maybe you can give them that secret that she yeah. um uh very interesting one question we got um from from someone listening that i thought was interesting is uh you're in denver obviously um why are you in 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 denver is it because of marijuana um are there other reasons that <laughs> the altitude uh so, so when, I, when i first told my friends uh i first posted on facebook that i'm moving to moving to colorado to start a new company that would be better in colorado uh everyone was like oh you're going into marijuana uh and i was like no 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 guys it's a different kind of getting high going exactly oh man i was gonna make that joke great well done <laughs> aviation is very spread out relative to tech and uh, if you want to go, uh, it was clear from day, you know, day one that a necessary ingredient in the success story, which by the way, I think, it's, I think it's really helpful to go imagine your success story with somebody else doing it. And like think about what that history is going to go like. And then that becomes your strategic plan. But I, we can come back to that if it's interesting. But so it was very clear that we'd have to have a dream team. And you'd have to go collect all those humans in one place because they're, they're very spread out today. And, uh, and then so it becomes, well, where, where's the best place to go collect great people? Um, uh, and where do you have a, a sufficiently low kind of cost of living, sufficiently low cost of uh, real estate uh, that, that the whole thing is you know, financially more tractable? And we, um, I, I collected the first kind of half a dozen people to be the first, uh, you know, first couple employees in the company. And uh, at the time, I thought the right answer was going to be Long Beach. Uh, we were going to go buy the um, the Boeing C-17 plant that was shutting down, kind of the way Tesla bought the Numi plant that GM and Toyota had shut down. And, um, and, it, and it turns out that everyone who wants to live in Long Beach already lives in Long Beach. Uh, and you, know, you, you say, how do you want to move to Long Beach? You work on supersonic jets. And you, just, you can just see the, the energy like drain out of their faces. And we said, well, okay, well, where would you move to, to work on this? And people were like, how about Denver? And uh, it turns out people love Colorado. Cost, uh, cost of living is reasonable. If you come from San Francisco, it feels free. Uh, you've got mountains. Uh, you've got all kinds of outdoors things. You've got great schools. You've got, um, uh, and this was important to us, you, you've got good experiences for a large range of demographics, whether you're, you're single and you want a single scene or you, you, you've got kids and you care about schools or you'd rather kind of be out of a rural environment and have more land. Like all of that is possible within 30 minutes of, of Boom headquarters, and so if you're if you're optimizing for talent, uh, and and your talent starts out diffuse, you you pick a place where the, the talent will be happy to concentrate. Right. That's very interesting, and it does seem like you timed this a little bit early, as you know, there's a large exodus, reported exodus. We'll see what actually happens. Yeah. So far, I think it's more of a retirement plan. Um, <laughs> But uh, there's a purported exit that's from, from uh, some of the coastal states. Um, yeah, I mean, every, everyone always declares, you know, if X happens, like I'm moving to Canada or I'm moving out of California or whatever, then the, uh, the, the reality of it often seems to be very muted. I think just like the body overreacting to COVID with a cytokine storm, there's a bit of a societal one. And, and uh, <laughs> well put. Um, uh, Blake, this is really cool. I do think you are building one of the most inspiring startups of, of the decade. Um, I cannot wait to use it. I do not want to fly it. So, but, but I would love to see it in flight simulator. So do, do let us know if you can make that happen. Um, uh, I think this is pretty inspiring. You know, we have a lot of people at Pioneer who are working, a lot of people are working on very tractable problems where you can demonstrate progress early on. Others are working on slightly more moonshotty things. And I find in the moonshot world, you have kind of earnest moonshot people that are very excited about kind of pragmatic approaches like you were, mm -hmm. uh, counter positioned against status seeking moonshot people who are very interested in working on something big because yeah. it will attract attention from people they admire. And I think it's very important to have people like you to counterbalance against the black hole of those other TED talker status maximizers. Um, so uh, very I- Very kind of you. 
I, I, I appreciate, uh, yeah, Doers plus Moonshot, I think is a good combo. It's a good combination. There, there is something, um, there is something special to picking something that inspires other people. Yes. And, and in my experience, the best way to do that is to pick something that inspires yourself because then you, you, you become contagious about it. And, and, when you're, and when you're in that mode, you can collect great people uh, who will want to go make you, uh, go help you make it happen. And then that's, that's, I think that's how you make a moonshot actually happen is you, you have to, you have to collect the talent. Bat signal. Yeah. The bat signal. The founder raises the bat signal in many ways. That's maybe their only job. Um, it's pretty true. Well, thanks again. Uh, and I, I do hope we get a chance to meet soon and, and maybe I'll see you at the unveiling. I don't know. Uh, well, that would be, that would be great. We have a flight simulator here that you can fly. Great. Uh, so yeah. we'll be happy to host you out here in Denver and let you, let you push forward on the throttle. Uh, it, would be great to ascend to heights in Denver of all kinds. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you again.